Hi, I'm Chris. And I'm Terry. And typically at this time of year, we would be hosting something called the Nengo Summer School along with students from my lab and folks at Applied Brain Research or ABR. The Summer School is an in-depth two week long workshop where people from around the world, typically industry and academia, come together to learn how to use Nengo. Nengo is a software tool that lets you build pretty much any kind of neural network, be it spiking network, non-spiking network, deep learning network, reinforcement learning network, anything. And in 2018, that two weeks went something like this. Fun, right? And uh, in 2019, we had these cool t-shirts that look like this. Um, but this year... I'm, I'm wearing the 2018 t-shirt, so sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we have, have actually, we have t-shirts going back to 2014 or 13, however long we've been running it. I don't actually... We should check that. I don't know. <laughs> it's been a while. Anyhow, uh, this year, of course, COVID. So we're not doing that this year. And instead, Terry and I thought, well, maybe we can take the couple of lectures that we do at the beginning of the summer school and put them online. So what we'll do, uh, today is the first one. We'll introduce ourselves, and then we'll jump in to show you what kinds of things people have done in the past with Nengo. So introductions, Terry. Hi. Uh, so um, I am Terry Stewart. Uh, I'm currently a uh, research officer with the National Research Council of Canada. Um, I was a postdoc and research associate with Chris for the last 10 years. Um, I've, my work is in uh, trying to understand the brain and trying to build uh, large brain models, um, including things like looking at um, how the basal ganglia lets you sort of make, make decisions and coordinate large scale brain models. Um, and I really like seeing whether or not these looking at the biology of the brain tells us new ideas about new algorithms that um, um, might both explain things about how humans think, um, but also might even be useful for industry. So that's the sort of research that I do. Great, and I'm Chris Smith. I am the director of the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at the University of Waterloo, where I hold a Canada Research Chair in Theoretical Neuroscience. I'm currently jointly appointed between philosophy and systems design engineering, which it makes for great conversations at parties. People wonder how that could possibly have those two things go together. Um, but for me, it makes a lot of sense because essentially I went into this field through philosophy where you ask questions about what are mental representations? How do states inside the head relate to states outside the head and so on? Um, but I also had an engineering background and really wanted to kind of answer those questions in a fairly technical way. And that led me down the path where, you know, we kind of looked at all kinds of modeling techniques, developed some frameworks for building spiking neural networks, uh, quite a bit of focus on biology and scaling things up to really big brain models, as Terry mentioned. And so, yeah, recently we've, you know, built a whole slew of tools and examples and everything that we have found very useful and that we like to share with people, which is what we're doing today. So to start, I think what we'll do is uh, give you an overview of things you can do with Nengo. Very, you know, rough, here's a bunch of stuff. Essentially, there's not a whole ton of organization to it, but it can give you a sense of what after a two week period you might actually come to be able to build. 
Okay, so as I mentioned, this first lecture is on things you can do with Nengo. And to get us started, this is the Nengo interface. So you can essentially see on the right-hand side, you have a code uh, environment, uh, an editor. On the left-hand side, you have something which is visualizing what you've typed in in the code, and you can also use it to run the model and look at data and so on. So in this GUI, we're right now building a model which is a, a controlled oscillator. This is a nonlinear dynamical system. You can see we're using spiking neurons. And one really interesting thing about Nango is that it's turned into kind of a neural compiler where you can express the sorts of things you want to do in terms of typical code type like functions and use sines and cosines and whatever you want. And then it figures out how to build uh, that network and embed those functions in connection weights and use spiking neurons. And unsurprisingly, this turned out to be really useful for trying to deal with neuromorphic hardware, which is a kind of hardware that essentially has spikes. And uh, as a result, Mango's started to be used uh, quite commonly as a front end to building models that can then run on that kind of spiking hardware. And this is something we'll talk about not irregularly over the course of a couple of lectures. In this particular case, you can see over here, we're changing the frequency of the stimulation. And over here, you can see that the uh, oscillator was actually going at different speeds depending on the input. And that's why this is a frequency controlled oscillator. All right. Terry, do you want to give a sort of description of the ecosystem? Sure. Um, Nengo's, like, we, since we've been developing it for the last, what, 15, 20, 15, it's got to be at least 15 years now. <laughs> yeah, um, or more, depending on yeah, what you count. Yeah. It started in MATLAB, went to Java, now it's in Python. So what we have here is, in the top left, the core aspects of Nengo. Um, and that's mostly what we're going to be focusing on. So Nengo Core has a programming language based in Python that lets you specify your algorithm and this is what, uh, what you would like the neurons to be doing. That's also tightly integrated with uh, uh, TensorFlow, Nengo Deep Learning. That lets us sometimes when we want to um, make use of deep learning to define our models, although a lot of times we'll not be using deep learning. A lot of times um, we'll be able to specify large scale neural networks in ways um, that let us have a little bit more control or a little bit more specification about what's going on at different steps um, rather than relying on uh, uh, deep learning. Of course, deep learning is very useful when it is useful, so we want to also include that, uh, those aspects. Both of those let you define your model and then the graphical user interface that we have on top of that lets us visualize and interact with the model while we're developing it, make sure it's behaving the way that we want it to. Um, and um, a lot of times we'll sort of do our initial, initial design using that user interface. And then uh, once we're happy with the model, we don't need the user interface again. In addition to that, on the right, we have a bunch of add-ons um, for Nango. Most of the, this is about helpful tools for defining larger models. So for instance, when we want to start doing uh, language manipulation and these sorts of high level cognition, um, this is gonna involve making a whole bunch of components that are built on things in the core, but um, it's more, it's gonna be useful for us to sort of build up a library of commonly used components. Um, so for instance, the work that I did in uh, building a basal ganglia model, that's sort of, okay, you don't need to respecify that. You just simply use the basal ganglia model from the Nengo library. On top of that, um, once you've got your model specified using both the core of the Nengo and these add-ons, um, now you also have to decide, well, what hardware is this going to run on? So that's the simulation backends that's sort of below this and uh, below those components in the diagram. And this is saying, well, we need to take this high level descriptions of our models and we need to compile it down to different hardware. Um, so we need to run it on the CPU in your laptop, or we need to run the model on the, the GPU in your graphics card. Um, or we want, may, you may have customized specialized hardware. So you might have FPGAs that we can run it on. Um, or there's also starting to be a lot of neuromorphic hardware coming out. So computer chips that are specifically designed to simulate neurons. Um, and we want to be able to take that same model, that same code that you've written that was running just on your laptop um, and have it target some of this more exotic hardware. Um, and on that exotic hardware, you've got very different neuron models 
um, than what we're running on your um, in your normal CPU or normal GPU. Um, and so the compiler, the Nango compiler, needs to take that into account when it's converting your model um, uh, into that hardware. Great, thanks. So that gives you a very high level overview of what Nengo is, and now we'll turn to a couple of different examples. Uh, I think the first one is yours, Terry. Sure. So here is a really simple example of having a simple agent running around an environment. Um, and this is just showing that, hey, you can go and implement simple sort of obstacle avoidance, move around, um, go and, and collect objects in, in this particular case. Um, you will note that there's also a little bit of running away from, uh, from things that are chasing it. Um, and this was all built up very, using just a small set of neurons. Um, and in this particular case, there's no, um, it didn't sort of experience the world and sort of learn how to do this behavior. It was more me saying, look, this is the behavior I want to impose on these neurons. Um, and it went ahead um, and found neural networks that behaved the way um, that I wanted the system to behave. Uh, the actual full code for that is sort of shown there on the right. So it gives you an idea of what we mean when we're saying um, high level programming is, is that code that's showing there on the right, that was what got co converted into um, this neural model um, that produces this behavior. Yeah, and this is why it's kind of like a compiler. I guess it's also nice to point out that uh, you made a special visualization that's just embedded and running right inside Nango for this. Yes, that's also a good point that um, Nango, the user interface also makes it easy to take um, little bits of Python code that sort of define an environment um, and use that um, right within the graphical interface itself, which is very useful for either doing simulated environments like this um, or also for interfacing to actual robots. Cool. So next, I'll talk a little bit about Spawn. This is uh, one of our more famous models, to be honest. And uh, in particular, I'll talk about Spawn 2.0. The first version was published in Science in 2012, and then it was Chapter 7 of the book, How to Build a Brain, in 2013. Uh, and since then, we've done a bunch of work on it. And so I'll give you a bit of an update, essentially. And it really is an example of how big things can get inside Nango. I mean, things can get bigger, but this is sort of the largest we've done so far. So the first version was about two and a half million neurons, and now it's up to about 6.6 .6 million neurons with around 20 billion effective connections, uh, which is lots. Um, we, we like Still to call it the world's largest. Brain, but <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, yes, by, by several billions, many, uh, a couple <laughs> orders of magnitude. But regardless, we like to call it the world's largest functional brain model, which I think is still an accurate description. And it does lots of different tasks, uh, 12, but counting tasks is really a bit of a weird thing to do, especially since one of those tasks is instruction following. So I'm never sure, do you count every instruction as a new task or, anyway, so we just count it as one task. Um, so let me just give you a few examples of what kinds of stuff it can do. Here's a basic perceptual task. Uh, in this task, it's looking at the images and then writing a zero if they're from different categories or a one if they're the same category. So there we just saw two monkeys. So it wrote a one and now show it a couple of dogs. So it's like, yep, same category. You'll also notice that, of course, it has an eye, which is its entire perceptual system. It has an arm, which is its entire motor output system. Um, the entire model is also spiking, so everything inside there is spiking neural networks until you get to the muscles, which you can see them sort of changing their tension as it draws uh, digits out. Uh, at this point, it's actually just recognizing the digits and writing down what digit it sees. And of course, one nice thing about this model is we can run exactly the same experiments on people or animals as we do on the model. So we can show people or animals inputs just like this, same images, and we can record their motor outputs, have them write numbers down, but of course, in a model like this, we can look inside. So here's an example of what we'd see if we looked in the visual cortex, some of the later parts of the visual cortex, and sort of instantaneously decoded, looking at just those spike patterns, what we guessed was being shown to the eye. You can see we do a pretty good job of that. But this wouldn't let us do the task, because you actually have to remember the number long enough to write it out. So in frontal areas, we have things that are more like memories. Here you can see after a digit's shown, it actually sticks around for a while, long enough for the model to write it out. And to do the writing, here's a 
look at the sort of high level motor area where it's planning out its trajectory. There's a bunch of other stuff that happens in order for it to actually execute the trajectory, but here we can look at kind of the high level plan. So this is nice because, you know, it lets us have access to literally every single parameter and activity and everything that we could possibly want that can explain that behavior. Uh, something which we don't have, of course, with biological systems. But this is a pretty simple task in a lot of ways. Um, really, we want it to do more cognitive things. So here's an example of a cognitive task, which you can do right now, figure out what goes in that question mark at the end. And of course, you've never seen this pattern before. You're looking across all of these squares and trying to figure out what the pattern might be. And I'm sure you are quickly getting it and figuring out what goes in at the end. We can uh, run the model on the same kind of task. So it's never seen this particular set of inputs before. It's not like it's memorized these patterns, but instead it's looking across all of these patterns and inferring what the next item will be. It's trying to learn the pattern based on these inputs. And so by the time it gets to the end, it will write out what it thinks should be used to complete the pattern, which hopefully is what you got, three fives. And uh, you know, we can do all kinds of other experiments with this. Like we could say, what if we gave it three fives, what would it do? And we can show it will write out four fives, which seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. Um, or if we gave it two sixes, what would it do? And it will write out three sixes. So we can actually try to infer what the rule is that it learned, um, just like we would with people, right? Really, we, we can, perform the same kinds of behavioral tests in a lot of instances. Uh, and this is really why we think this is kind of exciting. Also because you can not only look at the high level behavior, but you can dive right down and figure out what individual neurons are doing. So Spawn does all this stuff and a whole bunch more. I've kind of listed them there at the bottom. Critically, we think it's also important that Spawn is not being changed between these tasks. All we do is show it a letter and a number, which says, okay, do task number four, and then do task number five, and do task number eight, and then we show it you know, different inputs depending on what, whether the task is copy drawing or counting or what have you. And uh, the basal ganglia model that uh, Terry talked about before is really focused on that. Like, how do you have the same model and route information in different ways to make it flexible and get it to do different things at different points in time? So that's really a core part of what makes Spawn special and I think a little bit different from what you typically see in artificial intelligence these days. So I'm gonna just jump and give you the kind of most extreme version of this. Um, this is an example of instruction following, pretty flexible instruction following. And I like to think of it like mental gymnastics, if anything. Mm -hmm. And to give you a sense of what it's gonna do, I will have you do this instruction following on your own. So. Close your eyes, or not if you don't want to, and imagine the letter V. Then imagine a capital B, and then take the B and rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise and put it on top of the V, and then erase the back of the B. What do you have left? So the two typical answers to this question are an ice cream cone or a heart. And what you can imagine is you basically, you know, generated an internal representation based on my instructions. And then you followed some manipulations of that to give you other internal representations. And then you kind of read off that internal representation at the very end. And so this is the kind of thing that Spawn's doing here. Uh, Spawn doesn't have the same kind of spatial reasoning uh, that we have, but instead it does know, uh, you know, all those different tasks and it can sort of count numbers, it knows a fair amount about numbers, what comes before what and after what and all that kind of thing. And so we can get it to do a bunch of instructions and follow those here. So what we're doing, just if you look at the bottom left corner there down here, you can see the different instructions that it's following. So the very first one is find pattern. That's like the cognitive task we just saw where it has to infer what pattern is the one that shows up uh, based on the inputs. Next we have do question answering. So QA means question answering, where we'll ask it a question about a series of digits that we show it. And then we say apply the pattern to that list. And by apply, we mean count. So, you know, if you have a three and the list is one and two, then you would output a four and a five because you counted both of those numbers up by three. And then at the very end, we're applying. And in this case, the pattern that was found to the position that was asked about. So you know, kind of complicated and weird, but hopefully getting a lot of the same kinds of um, sort of internal techniques you used when thinking about the heart. Let me hit play. 
Right, so MP1 means start at the first subtask and then we're showing it some inputs, a one and a three, and then a two and a four, and it's like, hey, those are increasing by two. So that's the pattern it found. Then we're showing it three digits and that's saying what's in position two, and it writes out a seven. So then we're saying, okay, apply the pattern you found, the two, to that list and write out the answer. So it's writing out a six, a nine, and a two. And then at the very end, we're saying, okay, apply the same pattern you found to the position we asked about, i.e. add two and two, and it writes out a four. So you can see the model has, you know, gone through the same kind of thing, constructed internal representations, manipulated those and so on, and come up with an answer. Uh, and we had it report the answers kind of halfway through, but you could also just have it report the answer at the very end if you wanted. Uh, and if this is not, again, a preset set of instructions, you can manipulate the instructions in all kinds of ways. You can show different uh, patterns. We've got a whole ton of examples that I'm not going to go into right now uh, about the sorts of fun things that you can do with Spawn. Now, as I mentioned, that's a you know, high level interesting task. We can actually compare that to uh, instruction following in humans and you know, see what reaction times look like and so on. And we've got some nice matches there. But we can also dive down right into the details of what the spikes are doing. So here you can see on the top, we've got spikes from the ventral striatum in a rodent. And on the bottom, we have spikes coming out of the ventral striatum in spawn. Both of them are performing a reinforcement learning task. And conveniently, we can do the same analysis on both to come up with those graphs that you see at the top here, up here, um, where in black, we've got spawn and in gray, we have the experiment filtered in the same way. So same data analysis. And you can see that, you know, they have a lot of the same kind of dynamics. They have this sort of decrease. And then right when the reward happens, you've got a big uh, sort of jump up and so on. And it's just one example of, you know, comparing sort of the model and the uh, rodent data in a very straightforward way, because again, we can just do exactly the same analysis. Before we go on to the next bit there, um, I will always yeah. want to point out whenever we, whenever we see that particular graph, yes, that difference at the end there, that is a statistically significant difference. So Spawn is not perfect. We do not have a model that is like, you know, perfectly able to fit everything. Um, there's definitely more research that needs to be done and more things to happen. But the fact that we're capturing it across, across most of that space, um, I think really helps uh, drive future research because we can say, okay, so what, what is going on that's slightly different there at the end? Um, but, but we still have a very good match across a lot of the system. Yeah, and actually that also reminds me kind of a bit of a different point, but we don't want Spawn to be perfect at these tasks because people, for instance, aren't perfect. So, you know, when we do um, examples where we get it to remember a list of digits, we want it to fail in the same way that people do. And that's actually important to us, uh, which again, not really going to talk about, but that is kind of, you know, one of the uh, focuses of doing cognitive modeling with Mango is to actually model the behavior that we see, not to get it to perform perfectly. You can also use Nango sort of the way people in AI do, where you're just trying to you know, get as good performance as humanly possible out of this model, which is great. And it's another way that we think Mango is fun to use. And I'll show you some examples of that as well. Uh, but in cognitive modeling, that's right. We want to make sure things match well. And in a similar vein, we can do that kind of analysis where we just take spikes from our, our model, spawn, or spikes from a monkey in this case, and uh, try to figure out what the tuning of the neurons are. So here we're looking at V1 in the model, V1 in a macaque monkey, and analyzing the spikes in exactly the same sort of way. And you can see in the top there and the bottom, we have very similar kinds of patterns. So you, know, you have some oriented kinds of patterns, uh, like this, you have some things that look more like center surround effects uh, in both. You have some which are kind of just like two bars instead of three and so on. Um, but you know, the interesting thing as with the previous example is that another kind of analysis that's very commonly done with neural data is one which is very natural to do with a model like this because your data is all spiking. So to give you a sense of what Spawn looks like inside Mango, uh, here's what we call a fly through. Now, this is really just opening up a bunch of the component parts that are make up Nengo, and you can dive into each of them, and you can see they have subparts, and right click and pull up some slides, or some uh, graphs rather, that we're going to want to look at data um, with respect to. And one thing I like to point out is that although there's all this structure in there, um, in the end, when you run the model, it's just a whole bunch of neurons, each simulated independently and individually 
that are sending spikes to a bunch of other neurons which have weights and neurotransmitters and synapses. And all of this structure is essentially lost in the sense you just have like a sea of neurons and communication like you do in the real brain. In the brain, we impose things like, you know, this is the motor cortex and this is vision. Um, and of course, we can map our model onto that, but we also, in the end, just end up simulating a bunch of dynamical systems, individual neurons, and connect them all together. And at the very end here, you can see this is just an example of Spawn remembering one input digit, and that's about it. Um, but the nice thing is that you can use the GUI up to the point where you're still doing these you know, really big models. This is, as we mentioned, six million neurons, uh, and you can run it inside here. And, of course, we've sped the video up a little bit. You know, when you actually run Spawn on a GPU, it's about 20 times slower than real time. I'm sure Terry was going to point that out. <laughs> so I jumped in. Uh, and this, of course, is one of the big motivations for uh, turning to things like neuromorphic hardware to run these big models. So if we pull Spawn apart a little bit, we can also look at the individual components to some extent. So this is a spike deeping deep network, spiking deep network rather, which is the visual system for Spawn. Uh, you can see we give it full color images and then on the right you can see what the classification of that image would be. This is a case where we, we just use deep learning. We trained it up uh, using deep learning methods. We have you know, special little techniques which are fairly straightforward to make it into a spiking network. Um, we can then take these kinds of networks and compile them onto neuromorphic hardware, which we've done in the past, and that's lots of fun. Um, but in this instance, just showing you that, yeah, we can take, you know, all the standard image net image inputs and classify them. We get typical types of accuracy in the spiking network and so on. The same accuracy you would for a non-spiking network. And you have the same number of neurons, the same architecture, the same pretty much everything, except one is running over time and generating spikes and the other isn't. Uh, we can also do the same thing on the motor control side. So Terry, did you want to describe this a bit? Sure. Um, so the same way that, well, neurons are used in the brain to do vision, um, but the neurons in the brain are also being used to do motor control. And motor, in the motor control situation, deep learning doesn't seem to be really um, the way, uh, necessarily the right way to go. Um, rather, what we've done here is take the motor control task and break it down into smaller parts. And each of those smaller parts turn out to be simple enough that you don't even need deep learning to get neurons to do them. Um, and, but once you've, once you've defined the task well enough at this sort of low level, then you can take these components, combine them together, and you get a motor control system. Um, so for instance, what we're seeing here is removing the little red circle around, um, and that's indicating the target hand position. Um, and then these neurons, what they're doing is they are uh, computing the math that says, okay, well, how much force should I apply to different joints in order to get my hand to move to that location? Um, and this particular model um, is one that uh, we have mapped nicely onto the motor control systems uh, in mammals. Um, and we um, have also, uh, in order to run this on a, on a real robot arm though, um, that's also a situation where you might want to have um, specialized hardware that'll let you run the model fast enough to do so, which I think Chris will show on the next slide. Exactly. So here is an example of running that same motor controller on Loihi. So this is a spiking neural network chip from Intel. And I'm uh, at this point in this video giving an example of different kinds of control. So this is an example of what you'd call traditional robotic control or non-compliant control where the robot is extremely stiff and dangerous to interact with. It would hurt you, uh, if, you if it decided to move where you were and you weren't paying attention. So people have designed things called compliant controllers, where now it's much more springy. Uh, this is all biological control is essentially compliant in this kind of way, uh, where you don't move extremely stiffly unless you have particular reasons to do that. So it starts out as a compliant control. One of the challenges with compliant control is that if you change the dynamics that it's expecting, then it essentially fails. So you can see on the top left here, this is showing what the correct position of the robot should be. And you can see that there's a little bit of a gap there because it's not getting to where it should be because we've given it a two pound weight that it doesn't know about. And so it's not able to generate the forces to overcome that weight. Uh, in contrast, the, one of the things that the spiking network does that the other controllers don't is that it introduces this adaptive component where we can give it that same weight and we can see it fail. But uh, over 
brief period of time. It's actually learning online how to correct for that change in dynamics and uh, you know, figuring out that, oh, when I'm in this arm position, I need to apply more force. And so over time, you can see that it gets uh, back up to uh, getting right to the target and it remains compliant, nice and springy and safe to interact with. Now that is an example of just moving in one particular location. Um, but of course we want it to be able to move no matter where it has to go throughout its reaching space to get to the target. And so here we're showing an example of giving it a hammer. So this is, you know, instead of a two pound weight, here's a particular tool. And now it's looking to see where's the tip of the hammer because it needs to actually move the tip of the hammer to its target, not its fingers as it was doing before. And once it's figured that out, uh, now we can show it a target, which is this little Santa Claus. And it's going to move towards that Santa Claus. But of course, um, you know, with a compliant controller, again, it fails, so it can't get to the target very well, no matter where we put it in the reaching space. And it's not getting any better because it doesn't have this nice adaptive component. Uh, and so at the end of the video here, we're gonna show what happens when you turn on that ad adaptive component and uh, see that, you know, just like we saw before, it can learn not only for one particular kind of target, um, but for a target that moves on the fly. And it has to do slightly different learning at different points because its arm is configured differently, the dynamics are different, gravity is having slightly different effects and so on. Um, but conveniently, after just a few reaches, it actually becomes, uh, you know, reasonably accurate. And, you know, this is modeling the kind of thing that happens in cerebellum. So you can do the same thing to people um, where you, you know, give them weird dynamics and they can overcome those uh, after several trials and start to move, you know, really quite accurately. Um, and if we've trained, once we've trained this controller, you know, for about 30 minutes, now it just can move with that tool in its hand uh, right to the targets in a reasonably short order. So this is an example of something where we've now combined a real robot and some neuromorphic hardware and uh, using, you know, techniques which are sort of unique to this controller to do something which biological systems are really good at, um, but past work using deep learning and so on has been uh, not quite as successful. So uh, here's a completely different kind of thing, and I'll turn it back over to Terry to explain this example. Yeah, sure. So in this one, we've got another simulated environment. Um, you can see it in the bottom right there, the little blue triangle is the agent, it's running around. Um, in this particular case, instead of vision, what it's got is uh, more of a how far away are obstacles in different directions. Um, and what we're doing here is we're having it as it moves around in its environment, it's trying to build up an internal mental map um, of that environment. And you can see that map slowly being created um, in the sort of top middle there. Um, importantly, in order to build up that map, um, it needs to know things like um, well, what's its current he uh, heading and orientation. Um, and that you're, you're seeing the set of group of neurons, the spiking activity there at the bottom um, is sort of the raw spiking activity of those neurons that are trying to keep track of um, what, what direction the agent is, is, is in. Um, and then at the top, the little, the little blue graph at the top is showing um, what does that neural activity mean? Um, so in this particular case, um, the, that neural activity is sort of saying, okay, here is what I currently believe my, my head orientation is. Um, and that's sort of a more, a more high level information than the raw spike activity that we're showing there. Um, similarly, you can sort of start to build up um, this sort of high level representation that we're seeing um, of the map itself in the middle. Yeah, and in this example, uh, you might have noticed that we are also playing with the map selectors. So it's actually changing the map uh, on this poor critter while it's trying to map it out. And so it actually has to keep exploring in order to figure out, you know, what's the current map since these people keep changing it. And then at the very top right, also we've got, you know, some neurons which have different kinds of sensitivities depending on what map it is. And these look like things you might find in hippocampus. Speaking of hippocampus, mm -hmm. uh, recently we've uh, come up with a new kind of representation which we're really excited about called spatial semantic pointers. Uh, this came out of a question Terry posed, like, do we have a way of, you know, representing things in continuous spaces? Because for things like spawn, we represent lots of structures. So, you know, it has to solve these intelligence test like uh, pattern things that it sees. It has to keep serial lists of information. It can have hierarchies. 
But these are all essentially discrete slot filler pairs. But Terry asked, well, you know, what if I want to got continuous slots effectively? Like I want to put a thing anywhere on a map. Uh, so he asked the question and surprisingly, somebody in the lab had actually already done a bunch of math, which is like, yep, yeah, you can totally do that. And here's the way that you can, uh, you know, go about constructing these representations. And so what we're showing in this example is in the top right, uh, this is a memory of uh, a bunch of different objects at different spatial locations. So you've got foxes and dogs and bears and stuff. Uh, and then once we have that representation, which is, ends up being just one you know, high dimensional vector, 250 dimensional vector, um, we can then say, okay, you know, where is the fox? So we're asking the question, what is the spatial locations of the fox? And then we can plot that out. And you see here, you can do a perfectly fine job of finding where the two foxes are, right? And their spatial locations. Same for dogs and the badger um, and the bear. And you can also ask for things that don't exist and then it will say nothing. So this is really interesting. This is the kind of thing that, again, the hippocampus seems to be importantly involved in, keeping track of spatial information where things are. Uh, and Brent Comer is just finishing up a PhD thesis looking into some of the details about the kinds of fun things you can do with spatial semantic pointers. Um, because it's so fun, people at ABR have also been playing with it. And here is an example where they're sort of simulating the dynamics of objects over time. And you can see these objects are bouncing off one another. And of course, here we're thinking, oh, maybe in cognition, when we simulate physical uh, dynamics in our heads, so this is when you're not seeing things, we're just kind of thinking about them, this kind of representation might be used. And you know, we can figure out if it's easy to update these neural networks and learn dynamics from looking at different scenes and so on. Uh, and yeah, that's moving along quite nicely. And again, it's a kind of representation which is built right into Nengo. It's very easy to use in Nengo. It's easy to run these things in spiking neural networks and to put them on hardware and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, yeah, here's another example of doing that kind of thing, Terry. Yeah, um, this is you know, sort of, let's go to even more extreme putting things on hardware here. Not only is this, are we running the neural networks um, in specialized hardware and then having that system control a robot, um, but we actually have that hardware on the robot itself. So the, uh, um, that little circular robot that you're seeing there has, um, it's uh, called Spinnaker, was the particular neuromorphic chip that's on there. Um, and it's designed to be a low power ch chip for simulating neurons. Um, and here we just took a model that is um, looking at that light that the person is holding um, and trying to both orient itself to, to point at the light, but also maintain a good distance from the light. Um, because it's got two uh, two eyes on there, so we can use that to sort of triangulate uh, how far away it is from the light. And there you can see it backing up. Um, uh, and again, this is all by uh, trying to take the algorithm that we want it to do and, um, and encode that in the neurons, rather than doing some sort of process like um, training the entire system over and over again on the task. Um, these are all examples where we um, build the individual components um, to do particular parts of the task and then put it all together and the full performance is what you see there. Yeah, and sometimes you don't actually have the robot. And for those cases, of course, it's fun to turn to simulators. Uh, this is an example of a simulator of a quadcopter. This is VREP. Uh, Mango has nice interfaces to VREP and Joko and a couple other physics simulators. And you can build additional ones if you want. Um, so here you can see on the left, a bunch of spikes. Those are actually coming out of Nengo and being put into the simulator's displayer. Uh, what the model's doing is actually running that same adaptive controller that we were using on the arm, but now it's using it on a quadcopter. And the quadcopter starts off without any particular um, unusual dynamics, so it kind of knows its dynamics, but then halfway through it's given a package and uh, that changes the dynamics of the quadcopter. So it, Kind of dips down there but then it very quickly figures out how to fly with that package and is able to get to targets even though the dynamics have changed and then we change the dynamics again by dropping the package and it can still fly around and you can do lots of other fun things in this environment where there's sort of wind where those red and blue arrows are and there's all kinds of other weird um, sort of dynamical functions going on where that circuit board thing is and we can see you know how good of a job can it do of adapting to all these different circumstances um, but definitely playing with this uh, 
simulator like this can you know be tons of fun and these simulators are getting extremely good so you can actually you know in reasonably short order sometimes <laughs> go from simulation to something which is much more like the actual hardware and here's an example for terry oh yes um, so stepping away from so the sort of vision and motor control things we've been showing on showing so far um, let's go back to a much more high level cognitive planning task. So this is a typical sort of psychology test task called the Tower of Hanoi, um, where you've got a bunch of rings on pegs and your object is to try to get all the rings or all the, all the rings onto the peg on the right, but your restriction is that you can only move one ring at a time and you can't put a um, large ring on top of a small ring. All right. um, so this is sort of, a task where you've got to plan ahead a few steps and you've got to figure out um, how it is that you want to, you want to do this. Um, and psychologists have sort of studied how people do this. And once you've learned the task, there's sort of, turns out there's a pretty straightforward algorithm that a lot of people um, settle on pretty quickly. Um, and the idea is that you sort of, you have in mind, oh, I would really like, I would really, I'm trying to move this particular disc right now. Um, that's the, uh, uh, shoot, which one is that one? That is, the, we're trying, the goal at any given point is to sort of move the uh, blue disc, uh, the disc that's highlighted in blue, um, onto the peg that's highlighted in, uh, in blue. And then red is sort of indicating, well, where is it paying attention to? Um, and the sort of algorithm that's going through is something like, okay, I'm going to look at the blue disc. Is it where it's supposed to be? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, good. Now I'm going to look at the, uh, the next disc, and I'm trying to move it on the right, but now I've noticed that the red disc is in the way. So now I'm gonna make a sub goal, and that is, hey, let's move that smallest disc over onto the left. Good, I've now succeeded at that. Now I can go back to say, okay, uh, what was I trying to do? I was trying to put the big disc over on the right. Okay, that's fine. I'm trying to get the middle disc over on the right. Oh, okay, and I've noticed that the red disc is no longer in the way, so now I can do that movement. Um, and now it should finally figure out that, okay, now, okay, the largest disc, that's in the correct location, the middle disc, that's in the correct location, um, and then the far uh, smallest one, okay, that's not in the correct location, but I can move the smallest disc because there's nothing smaller than it. So then it goes ahead and solves that task. Um, mm -hmm. And interestingly, when we go and look at the timing of that sort of task, um, Different discs, when you, as it's solving the task, there tends to be longer pauses um, because there's more to think about, there's more to, to look at, um, uh, th there's more reasoning steps you have to go through. Um, and so there is longer pauses in the model um, at certain points in that task. And those match on really nicely to the longer pauses that happen when people um, are also performing this task. Um, yeah, so, this, so that's sort of an example of doing um, very high level planning and reasoning, um, but using exactly the same components um, that we were uh, showing for the vision and the motor control. Everything is all still spiking neurons. Um, they're organized in a very particular way. In this case, they're organized um, in a way that's similar to the uh, basal ganglia, which is sort of the a part of the brain that is pretty dedicated to this kind of uh, planning type or, or uh, sequential organization of, of actions. For something completely different, yet again, you know, we just saw examples looking at robots, and then Terry changed it up and showed us a sort of cognitive example. Um, and we also do just like theoretical work. And one of the really fun theory results recently comes from Aaron Volker and his work on what we're calling the delay network now. This is uh, essentially trying to answer the question, if I was given an input that was changing over time, and I wanted to remember it, what's the most efficient way of remembering it? So seems like a pretty simple task, seems like one which probably has some relevance to biology and so on down the road, but we can just think of it as a purely, you know, functional input output mapping kind of task and see, well, what's the best way to solve that? So Aaron asked this question, he answered it and discovered this thing called the delay network, which is a particular kind of recurrent neural network, which is provably optimal for exactly this delay task. Uh, the task is actually really hard when defined that way because 
we didn't say anything about you know how many frequency components there are in the input uh, and of course if you let it be arbitrarily high frequency that means you're essentially saying can i remember an infinite amount of information over any extended period of time the answer to which is no so instead what you're really answering is well what's the best i can do with constraints put on my resources so if i have you know a limited number of neurons like every brain does um, what what can i do the really interesting thing is that you can answer that question, you can implement it in spiking neurons, you can compare it to neural data that people have recorded from rodents doing these kinds of tasks, and you actually find a surprisingly good match. Um, and the way of thinking about what it's doing essentially is taking an input kind of like this one, and then mapping that one dimensional input where it kind of goes up and then back down into this higher dimensional space. So this is kind of like the underlying representation over the delay. So that's while it's sort of memorizing things. So this is the delay here. Uh, and while it's in that uh, high dimensional space, you can think of it as essentially just keeping track of what happened in the past. And you can actually say, oh, what happened half a second ago? So that's what this dotted line is. And if you plot out what it thinks happened half a second ago after a one second delay, then it will generate this. And you know that's not too bad. Um, it's got a couple of artifacts and things, but in fact, this is as good as you can do for this number of neurons and this dimensionality of representation. Uh, and um, yeah, I think it's been very exciting to see how this you know, thing that started as a really theoretical idea has done a good job of mapping onto this rodent data. It's been used recently by some other researchers for understanding how people represent time delays. Uh, and also we've turned and said, hey, you know, if this really is optimal at representing stuff over time, um, what does that mean for the neural network literature and machine learning? Um, and if you turn to machine learning, usually when you're doing time series analysis, you use something like an LSTM. Um, so this is kind of a special re recurrent neural network where you've got a bunch of additional gates and things that people have introduced because it turns out to be much easier to train with those gates than a, a vanilla RNN, as people call it, where you just take all of the outputs and stick them back on the inputs. So comparing to the sort of state-of-the-art standard machine learning technique that people use, LSTMs, we can show the LMU is way better for the delay task, the thing it was optimized for, where if you look at this graph, um, essentially the uh, red is the LSTM performance, and this is error along the side. Um, so for, you know, long-ish kind of uh, performance. So for the LSTM, that's about like trying to remember 1600 time steps in that window. It's not doing that great, right? You're getting quite a bit of error. Um, for an LMU, remembering 100,000 time steps of information, so a couple orders of magnitude more, uh, you get really low error. So it's like this is a you know log scale, so uh, 10 to the negative 7 more error for 1600. Um, even if you look at things like a hundred, you're still getting way more uh, accuracy encoded by the LMU here. So this is nice. This kind of shows us that, yeah, you know, if we take this theoretical thing and we say it's optimal and we compare it to something which doesn't make that claim, then we can do better, which is great. It also uses way fewer parameters, but this is not really what machine learning people care about, right? They want to see its performance on tasks. So this is a standard benchmark for recurrent neural networks. It's called PSMNIST. It's really kind of a weird task where you take the MNIST digits, you show them one pixel at a time, but before you do that, you randomly mix up the pixels. Um, and it's the same random mixing for every digit, but the model doesn't know that. And it has to figure out, well, what was the digit you showed me, even though you're only showing me one item at a time. So you're basically turning an image into a time series. Uh, and you can see that out of all the RNNs now people have proposed recently, so these are a bunch of state-of-the-art results, that the LMU is, is doing better uh, by you know, reasonably significant margin in the case of uh, uh, MNIST, dealing with MNIST, where a couple of percent actually makes a big difference. And we've actually gotten better numbers than this. This is out of a paper that we published last December. Uh, and so you know, that's definitely quite exciting. We've uh, also looked at its application to a bunch of other more interesting things like natural language processing and um, doing sort of like uh, analysis of cybersecurity situations where you want to say, oh, is this packet dangerous or not dangerous, and so on. Uh, but in any case, all of that work is, again, the kind of thing that we can do inside Nengo. We can take those same representations and 
run them on spikes, we can put them on neuromorphic hardware, we can put them on non-neuromorphic hardware, um, and so on. And uh, we've had a lot of fun with this and we're continuing to do that because it's actually, yeah, don't know where it's gonna lead us at this point. Um, so we've introduced two pretty new things. Uh, one was the SSPs, so spatial semantic pointers for representing space, and another is this LMU for representing time. You'll notice that the theme there is both of these are working in continuous domains, right? Continuous space and continuous time. And uh, over at ABR, they've actually put these two things together, which is kind of fun, and then use that to do prediction. And Terry's actually doing a bunch of work in this direction as well. Um, but here you can see on the left, we've got the history um, and the representation in the LMU is why it's kind of smeared out. Um, but what we're then doing is predicting based on the current state, right? I don't know if I can move my cursor fast enough here. So here's the current state, right? And then it's predicting where it's gonna be some short time in the future. And that's what this blob is. This is like where it's gonna be. Um, so the LMU is being to represent how this ball is bouncing over time. And then we're using that representation to predict the future. And on the right hand side, you see the ground truth, right? That's the exact right answer. So we can see that, you know, it's not doing too bad of a job, right? It would actually tell you where something is going to end up in the future um, if you, if it can uh, just see a little bit of history. So again, you know, kind of food for thought, uh, exciting possibilities, and the sort of thing that Nengo is, makes easy to, to do. Uh, here's another example from ABR that I think, Terry, you, you will talk about. Cool. Um, so this one is a little bit more of an industry application where what we're doing is keyword spotting. We're trying to recognize words in speech. Um, and this is instead of like just sort of recognizing entire sentences, this is more for your, you want a device that just sort of, you know, just finds very, very particular words like the, um, uh, okay, Google sort of uh, initial phrase that sort of wakes up um, Google to listen to your, your commands. Um, the industry is really interested in this because they want to have, and there's a, there are already custom chips that are specifically for these sorts of neural networks, but because they're running all the time, you really want to make sure that they're as energy efficiently, as, as energy efficient as possible. Um, so what we've done here is take some of these standard techniques, uh, sort of, this is a two layer neural network, um, and do a little bit of pre-processing on the, on the audio in order to turn it into different frequencies, feed that into the system, and then try to um, uh, de determine which word we think it is. Um, the custom thing, the special thing that we're doing here is we're taking advantage of the fact that we have this automatic compiler for particular hardware. Um, so we can take this exact same algorithm, try it on different hardware, um, and see what's uh, and see what's happening, um, and see how we can adjust the energy efficiency. Um, and what we're seeing there at the bottom um, is sort of exactly the same network uh, running on lots of different hardware, um, and Nengo combined with uh, Luigi, which is one of these neuromorphic chips uh, that have come out of Intel. Um, ends up having five times more, more efficient than the next the closest hardware. And that's hardware that was specifically designed to be as energy efficient as possible. Um, whereas Luigi is actually just a test chip that wasn't even optimized to be energy efficient. It was just optimized to do spiking neurons. The last example we'll leave you with is uh, pretty different again. So, you know, we went from Spawn to a bunch of different parts of Spawn to robots to machine learning uh, and you know many places in between and we'll just end on this one example which is another spawn model but here maybe you don't care about machine learning you really want to get to the biology of your model right you want to not just uh, simulate a bunch of neurons doing some cognition but you want to simulate really realistic neurons or at least more realistic neurons than what people typically do so we're showing an example of that here. What we've done is taken Spawn and simulated a small population of neurons, those ones that are sort of outlined in red, that are the results of the ones that are outlined in red. And we've basically said, okay, if you introduce these really realistic neurons, then you know, how does that affect the performance of the model? 
Um, and more than that, we're like, well, why would we bother introducing more realistic neurons? And the answer is because we could do new manipulations of the model, right? So in this instance, we're going to apply a drug called TTX to part of the uh, model and see what the consequences are. We couldn't do this in the original spawn model because it used simple neurons, which didn't really model different kinds of neurotransmitters and channels that are affected by TTX. So in this instance, we do have that and we can model that consequence. So uh, in the front there, we've got the spawn plus, which is the biological one. And in the back, we've got the regular spawn. And we can see that when we give it TTX, it's now you know, doing a uh, memory task. So it's getting the same inputs. But when we ask it, okay, what did you see? The one that's got the TTX is sort of starting to write things out, but it's essentially forgetting what it's doing. You can see the representation here kind of disappearing, and so it stops, right? So it's basically saying the consequence of this drug isn't that you can't put information in memory, but it's kind of like you lose track of what the task was asking you to do, and so you can't write out the right answer. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting to think about how you can start to build these models, do these manipulations, and see when I manipulate a drug, so something very low level, what consequences might that have for cognition? Um, and I think this is really just the beginning of the kinds of things that you can start doing with models like Spawn when you extend them to uh, in ways that look more biologically plausible. Um, and it's an interesting contrast, but again, something that's uh, really well supported by Nengo, a contrast that is to using, you know, doing AI and deep learning and robotics and so on. Um, but the tool itself, because all of this is neural networks one way or the other, really lets you span this breadth of application and example. So with that, I'll just conclude by saying, you know, one of the motivations for building Nengo as a tool in the first place really comes from Richard Feynman, uh, or at least the kind of attitude he expressed when uh, on his blackboard, after he had passed away, there was the following written right at the top of the blackboard. It said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And the idea here is that with tools like Nengo, we can express what we understand by trying to create these complicated models, be they for cognition or robotic control or improving the state of the art in artificial intelligence. And so over the next few lectures, we're going to take a deep dive into what Nengo lets you do, uh, what the math behind some of the techniques that we've given you examples of today looks like, and just really get you to the point where you're comfortable going off and exploring whatever you want on your own, whether it's cognition or deep learning or robotics or neuromorphics. So that gives you some idea of the breadth of things you can do with Nengo, all the way from cognition and modeling single neurons to robotics to deep learning, neuromorphics and everything in between. And hopefully over the next little while, you'll join us for the set of lectures that end up coming out of this. We're not really sure how many there will be, but we'll give you enough so that you can essentially become proficient in using Nengo and go off on your own and do whatever you want. Uh, so with that, I think we'll say goodbye and hope to see you at the next lecture. Yes, thank you so much. And um, I hope you're enjoying it as much as we do. Uh, so please come back and we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Bye.